Last video, we introduced the canonical forms of symbolization for the quantifiers, and we talked about quantifier meaning. Uh, we looked at some very simple examples, but really what we need to do is look at complex groups and properties and learn how to symbolize them. What we're going to start with are the stylistic variants of our quantifiers. Remember that we had lots of stylistic variants for all our connectives, and now the same thing applies to the quantifiers. Unfortunately, it's not as nice as it was before. So let's start with the universal. You've actually heard me use a bunch of the canon or sorry, the stylistic variants of the universal already. So you've heard me use all, every, each, for all, for every, and so on. Uh, so it's not too complex with the universal. There is something called the zero article. I will actually be using that example throughout this video, so I'll just point out what a zero article means. It just means there's no word like the or a in front of it. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's actually quite natural. I had to Google what it was called. I didn't know it was called a zero article, so we'll worry about that later. Uh, for the existential, again, I've been using a bunch of these already. Something, at least one, there is a, there is, uh, so there is some, there is at least one, that, when I can say like that mouse over there or something like that. These are all stylistic variants of the existential. So, so far so good. Unfortunately, there are some problem variants. It turns out the, a, any, some even, these are sort of problematic in some ways, and I'm not going to go over how they're problematic in this video. We'll have one later on in this unit, which talks a bit about sort of the, just the problems and oddities of the English language in relation to the stylistic variants. So when we're looking at a sentence, one of the first things we want to do is determine whether or not it's a universal or an existential. Uh, I think these are pretty straightforward examples, so I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. If I say all hedgehogs are smelly, clearly this is a universal statement. And if I say some hedgehogs are smelly, clearly that's an existential statement. Uh, if I say this or that hedgehog is smelly, and I'm, I'm sort of gesturing at a single one, uh, I mean that in the existential sense. So I say each and every hedgehog is smelly, that's just a variant of the universal. And here is my zero article. If I say hedgehogs are smelly, and I'm sort of just making this general claim, uh, this is a universal. Now, I did mention that this is sort of a problematic one in the previous slide. If I say the hedgehog is smelly or a hedgehog is smelly, I'm going to, so for this video and for a lot of my videos, just treat this as a universal, but I'll talk about this a little bit more in the video where we go over the problematic uh, stylistic variants. Okay, so what's a complex group? A complex group is essentially just a subject that has more than one predicate attached to it. So scary cats has the predicate for scary and has the predicate for uh, cats. And so I have scary cats that combined makes this complex subject. Cute dogs is a complex subject or group. Brave mice with helmets on, same thing. It's just a way of stating the subject of the sentence, except it just so happens that the subject has to be sort of captured in a variety of ways. And for a complex uh, group, this is often seen in a restrictive clause, and it modifies the group or the subject in terms of the canonical form. So all of these things would go in the antecedent for a universal or in an existential before the main uh, conjunction, because that's the canonical form of an existential. For complex properties, it's the same story. You can say anything you want to say about a subject. It's not always something super straightforward like is scary or is evil. You can say they're neither friendly nor nice, or they make great pets unless they think they are cats. Uh, or you can say steal the cheese only if they are quick. None of these examples really matter per se. I'm just showing you that obviously we can have complicated subjects and complicated groups for properties as well. And we've seen that this can also be the case in non-restrictive non clauses where we add sort of extra properties to our subject. And these things modify the properties of the group. So anything that modifies the property for a universal comes in the consequent, and for an existential, it goes after the main uh, connective of the conjunction within the parentheses. Let's take a look at this in an example. So let's symbolize brave mice with helmets on, steal the cheese only if they are quick. When you look at an, a question like this, one of the first things you want to do is you just want to identify what you think the group is or the subject of the sentence. So when we take a look, it seems that what we're talking about are brave mice with helmets on. And then if that's the case, what property are we bestowing on this subject? What is it that we are saying about brave mice with helmets on? Well, we're saying that they steal the cheese 
only if they are quick. So we have this quick breakdown between our subject and the property we're saying about the subject or group. The next thing we really want to do is we want to ask, what quantifier are we talking about? Are we talking about all brave mice with helmets on, or are we talking about some brave mice with helmets on? I find it really helpful to say that out loud. When you say it out loud, it really sort of makes it clear one way or the other, or at least for me, I find that. Uh, this is also the zero article example, so we know that this is a universal. So we're going to symbolize it in the standard way. Group, arrow, property. Okay, so I know the group, brave mice, helmets on, and we'll worry about the property later. So when I look at the abbreviation scheme, I see B for brave, D for mouse, and F for has a helmet on, and I symbolize it in the standard canonical universal way. So I'm going to use X as my variable. You could choose Y, Z, whatever you wanted, and I get for all X, bx and dx and fx arrow. So I'm saying that the group, the subject here, has to have all these properties, which is why I use a conjunction for everything in the antecedent of my symbolization. So now I want to focus in on the property here, steal the cheese only if they are quick. So of course there's a critical word here, only, which you are very familiar with at this point. So I'm just going to cruise through how we tackle that. So now I'm just going to symbolize steal if quick. So I'm just going to ignore the fact that there's only, and I get hx arrow gx. And now to symbolize with the word only, we know that that swaps the antecedent and the consequent, and I get gx arrow hx as my property. So notice that my property itself is also a conditional, and that might be odd, but it doesn't really matter that it's conditional. It can be anything we want as long as we preserve the main connective, which is the blue conditional that separates the group from the property. So let's clean things up a little bit. We just need to finish up. You, you may have noticed that I haven't closed the parentheses of the scope of the universal, so I'm just going to do that now. And that is the final symbolization. There are lots of correct logically equivalent solutions available to us. So here's the same uh, symbolization I had on the previous page. And we can make lots of trivial variants of this. One example, I can scramble the order of the conjunctions in the antecedent, because I know that that order doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if I'm saying a brave mouse with helmet on, or something with a helmet on that's a mouse and brave. It doesn't matter at all. We arrive at the same place. I can also change the way I uh, thought about the only. I could use some sort of contrapositive, or maybe you think about it as an only as a disjunction, because we know that these are all logically equivalent. So you could write any of those as well. Uh, lastly, another trivial logically equivalent solution is I could have used a different variable. There's nothing forcing me to use x. It's just out of habit that I always use x uh, right off the bat. Now here is a very important type of logically equivalent sort of uh, solution that is worth going over, and this is exportation. We've seen exportation already in our symbolization back in sentential logic, but exportation actually sort of matters a little bit more in predicate logic because it might uh, sort of, uh, certain exported forms might seem more natural for you. So that's why it's good to know that all of these moves are okay. So here's the symbolization we arrived at, and I have the blue highlight for the uh, group and the orange for the property, just like uh, how we broke it down. But you could have conceived this different, differently. You could have actually symboled it, symbolized it this way, which says, for anything, if you're brave and a mouse, then if you have a helmet on, you also uh, steal the cheese, etc., etc. So all that stuff works. And so this is an exported form where we took a something from the antecedent that was just in a string of conjunctions, and we instead actually put it in the consequent with another conditional. So these moves, again, you've seen this before, there's nothing wrong with this. But what makes this different is that when you do these moves in predicate logic, it's sort of like you're just seeing the group as being something different. You know, so for example, in this one, I could have seen the group as, actually, we're just talking about brave things, everything that's brave. Then, for anything that's brave, it has the following property. And so you can cut it up any way you want. Uh, you can also sort of hear some more variants. Uh, you can also have moved the GX into the antecedent as well if you want to by doing uh, sort of reverse exportation. It doesn't really matter how you worry about it. So this says, uh, if you're a brave mouse with a helmet on and you steal the cheese, then what's your property? You must be quick. 
I think this last one is actually quite a natural way of understanding that sentence that I had before, and I wouldn't be surprised if many of you uh, came up with this solution on your own instead of the one that I originally provided, and that would be perfectly fine. When you're thinking about exportation, you sort of realize that the group property distinction is entirely relative. There's no single right answer. Uh, of course, there are lots of wrong answers, so you don't want one of the wrong answers, but you can just arrive at whatever answer makes sense to you, and that just means pick the group that makes sense to you. You don't have to make sure that it matches up with your neighbor or anything like that. It just has to be a group that makes sense to you, but the property must fit with the group. So that's a really important tip. You don't have to stress too much about the group property distinction. It's relative, and exportation shows you that. Here's another example. There is a dog with a round and square head who is not happy. We're going to go through with this one pretty quick. I just wanted to do an existential example and show you that it's a bit easier. Uh, here I think this is the natural subject, a dog with a round and square head, and that means that the property is not happy. Are we talking about all dogs with round and square heads, or are we talking about some dog with round and square head? Uh, well, it seems obvious when I say there is a, I'm talking about an existential, so we know that we're going to go to the canonical form, which is, of course, group and property. So again, I'm using x. I get there exists an x, and the group is dog with a round and square head, so ax and gx and hx. And now I just have to say the property, not happy. That's just negation k. And I have my symbolization. Now notice, I didn't stress out about putting my group in parentheses. I could have. If I wanted to, it's totally fine, but you don't have to because informal notation still means that the rightmost uh, conjunction is the main connective, and that's fine. Uh, once you see this, you can actually easily generate a lot of logically equivalent answers because the order of how you put conjunctions doesn't matter at all. This makes symbolizing the existential naturally easier than symbolizing the universal. Because the universal is a conditional, we have to worry about the order of what's in the antecedent and what's in the consequent, but for the existential, things aren't, are, are a lot easier because we don't have to worry about that order. Now that we've looked at some pretty straightforward symbolizations, uh, we can sort of talk about the importance of scope and what a scope sort of problem is. You want to know this because you want to avoid having scope problems when you symbolize. So this is the correct solution for uh, the example uh, a couple examples ago, um, but here is uh, sort of an interesting example of a scope problem. See if you can spot it. So there's something wrong with this symbolization, and the thing that's wrong is that the tail end there, fx arrow gx, it's not under the scope of the quantifier for all x. So you can see the quantifier for all x the scope of the, that quantifier is actually just the antecedent. It's just bx and dx and hx. And there's nothing that is uh, sort of binding the, the variable in the consequent fx arrow gx. So actually, that thing we're looking at isn't a sentence. It's a well-formed formula, but it's not a sentence, which means it can't have any meaning or truth value, and that cannot be the right symbolization. So always look out for that. Make sure you don't have a scope problem where you have a free variable. Here's another example where we do actually have uh, a proper sentence. There's no free variable at all. Uh, everything is bound. But this is also a very common scope problem. So we have the same thing. The first universal quantifies over the antecedent. But and then I fixed the scope problem uh, from above by adding for all y into my fy arrow gy. I used y. It doesn't matter why I used y. So you could pick any variable that you want. So for all y, fy, arrow, gy, but why is this wrong? So there's nothing, I have the check mark because I fixed the scope problem in the sense that this is a perfectly well uh, written sentence. There's no free variables. But I have the x because somehow this doesn't capture the meaning of what I wanted to say. Somehow this doesn't capture the sentence, brave mice with helmets on steal the cheese only if they are quick. And so the question is why? The answer to why is really all about scope. Scope tells us that certain things are talking about the same subject or certain things are talking about a different subject. So whenever you have a new scope, you should think of it as being a new group or subject. And whenever you have the same scope, it is necessarily the same group or subject. 
So I say the word necessary, that's sort of important, because when I say a new scope is a new group or subject, it could be actually be the case that when you invoke a new subject, it turns out to be the same as what you were talking about before. But that's just sort of a coincidental fact. Uh, the same scope being the same group and subject, that's a necessary claim, and that's why it matters. So let's look at this sort of uh, sentence I have written here in the slide. That first universal quantifier, which is quantifying over the left conjunct. Because that's for all x, it's the scope, the entire thing, I know that those three instances or three occurrences of x that I have the green arrows going to are all talking about the exact same thing. So at the end there, that hx that I have, that hx, that thing, is the same thing that is also an f and a g at the beginning. And that's what scope is telling us, that they're all about the same thing. So there, when I have the EY, FY, that's just its own contained thing as well. So that Y is just has that property F, and so this is just saying, oh, there's something that's an F, fine, no problem. And similarly, at the end there, this says there's something that's a G. Now, even though I use the same letters, the same Y letters, notice that the, the scopes are entirely different of those quantifiers. They don't overlap in any way. So the thing that's a G is not necessarily the, thing, the same thing that I said was an F before. That's what scope is telling us. It's about the subjects and linking things together. So when we think about that, we come up with some nice symbolization tips. You should open a scope whenever you're using a new group, and you should close the scope whenever you are done with that group. This is a really important tip. I'm gonna come back to this in a later video and again in an even later unit. But you might look at these two sentences and think that they are the exact same. The only difference is that in the first sentence, the scope of the universal is over the entire sentence. And in the bottom one, the scope of the universal is only on the left side of the biconditional. But you should see that it doesn't really matter in a sense. There is no x on the right side of the biconditional, so I'm not really doing anything weird when I'm doing this. But it turns out that these two sentences are not equivalent. They're not the same. And so you want to avoid having to worry about things like this because uh, it just gets really tricky, as we'll see in a later video. So the way to avoid this is you don't want to write sentences like the first one, where the scope of a quantifier runs over things that no longer contain the variable. So you can see in the first sentence, I should have closed the scope of the for all x before the biconditional because there's no x's anywhere else in the sentence. And so that's why, according to my tips, the bottom sentence is the better way to symbolize. What does this all have to do with the brave mice example? Uh, it's, tell, it's, it's a way to understand reference terms. So reference terms like pronouns, reference terms tell you to use the same group. Here's that example again. Brave mice with helmets on steal the cheese only if they are quick. What's the reference term here? It's the word they. What they is telling you is that the thing I'm talking about when I say steal the cheese only if they are quick is the exact same thing that I'm talking about before, which are brave mice with helmets. That is the referent of the word they, brave mice with helmets on. So you can see in this bottom example why this is a scope error problem. On the left, I am talking about brave mice with helmets on, and on the right, I'm talking about the steal the cheese only if they're quick, sorry, the consequent, that's what I'm talking about under the, oh, with the red underline. But because I closed the scope at the antecedent and started a new universal quantifier on the consequent with a different scope entirely, these are not talking about the same thing anymore. I've lost and I have not captured the word they, and that's why this is wrong. Here's another example of an important use of a complicated group. Cats and dogs are fluffy. How do we symbolize that? Well, it actually looks like this is pretty straightforward, and here are two logically equivalent attempts at symbolizing this. So cats and dogs are my group and is fluffy as the property. Notice that the variance here, I'm just switching the order of dog, cat, cat, dog. That obviously doesn't matter. And I have used the correct canonical form of the universal. This is a zero article. Cats and dogs means all cats and dogs are fluffy. So there's nothing seemingly wrong with this, but it turns out that this is wrong. And the question is why? Well, it's actually wrong for an obvious reason. 
what is the group here when I say for all x, dx, and gx, arrow fx? I'm saying for anything that is a cat and a dog, then it's fluffy. Which is the sentence, cats and dogs are fluffy, but I haven't captured the meaning, and that's sort of an oddity of the way that we symbolize and the way that we sort of speak. Because I don't mean something that is a cat and a dog at the exact same time. That is not what I'm talking about. So even though this says cats and dogs are fluffy, I need to be careful and not symbolize with a conjunction in the group because I don't want to invoke a cat dog. I'm not talking about cat dogs. I'm talking about cats and dogs. So how do we get around this? Well, a way to get around a lot of problems in symbolizing in predicate logic is by paraphrasing. So when I say cats and dogs are fluffy, what I'm really saying is if something is a cat or a dog, then it is fluffy. If, if X is a cat or a dog, then X is fluffy. And when you break it down this way, symbolizing is immediately straightforward. What I realize is I should have symbolized this with a disjun disjunction in the group, in the antecedent, and to say if you're a dog or if you're a cat, then you have this property. Now you might think this is odd. Why would I symbolize the word and with a disjunction? Well, it turns out that this is just a variant of a way of symbolizing it. Another way you could think about the statement, cats and dogs are fluffy, which is very natural, is to realize that this is just an abbreviation of two separate statements. The first is, cats are fluffy, and the second is, dogs are fluffy. And so if you wanted to symbolize it with naturally as an and, this is the way you have to do it, and not the cat-dog way up above. Be careful of this. This one comes up all the time. Always be on the lookout for the cat-dog example. Let's finish with a more complicated uh, example that sort of just ties a lot of our skills together and also reminds us of some of the old sort of things that we had to uh, learn when we did symbolization in sentential logic. Puppies, which are not easy to raise, and kittens are fun to play with. However, someone in Toronto dislikes animals. Here's my abbreviation scheme. You can t take a look at it. Uh, it's nothing too exciting. When I look at a sentence like this, the first thing that jumps out to me is the comma which, which is a non-restrictive clause. So I need to symbolize which are not easy to raise. You can do this at the beginning or at the end. It doesn't matter. I'm going to start off by symbolizing which are not easy to raise. So I just have to always figure out what the subject is. What am I talking about? What is the thing that's not easy to raise? Well, in this example, it's very straightforward. It's just puppies. And then do I mean all puppies or some puppies? Well, I mean all puppies. So I can just get started and I can symbolize all puppies are not easy to raise. Now, the symbolization of that is very straightforward. There's no complications. For anything, if you're a puppy, then you're not easy to raise. Notice I have the conjunction there, that and, and that's because that's how we separate out the non-restrictive clause, just like we did in sentential logic. I'm ready to move on and symbolize the rest of the sentence, uh, but I'm going to symbolize it piece by piece. So I'm going to symbolize everything up to that however with the semicolon because I know that that's a main break term. So I'm going to just ignore that the however is there for now and symbolize puppies and kittens are fun to play with. Again, I want to find the group or the property, or the group or the subject and the property. And so the group here is puppies and kittens and the properties is, are fun to play with. So again, straightforward, uh, this is a universal, so I'm just ready to give it a shot. Of course, you want to be careful. This is the cat-dog example. It says puppies and kittens, but I don't mean something that's a puppy and a kitten at the same time. I mean something that's a puppy or a kitten, then it has the property, they are fun to play with, and that's why I have arrow FY. Notice that I used the variable letter Y here. I could have used X if I wanted to. Even though I used x already, because I closed the scope, it's like the x is available again for me to use. It doesn't matter. If you want to use a different letter every time, that's totally fine. So in this case, I changed to y. Okay, so that's that. I've put some parentheses around it. And now the however is uh, on the page with that green and there. And the last thing I need to symbolize is someone in Toronto dislikes animals. I'm going to do the exact same thing every time. I'm going to try and isolate what I think the group is and what I think the property is, and then I ask myself, is this all people, all people in Toronto, or is it some pe person in Toronto? Clearly it's some, so this is an existential. So I just invoke the canonical form of the existential, which is just a bunch of conjunctions in a row, and there is the rest of that symbolization. So I just want to do one last check. I want to make sure that I got the main operator right in this sentence, 
And when I read it in English, it seems that however must be the main operator. So I have to just make sure that all my parentheses are good in my symbolization. And there you go. That is the conjunction which was paired with however, and uh, it is the main operator. So I symbolize the sentence piece by piece. But the important thing is, each time I looked at a piece, I asked the same questions. What's the group? What's the property? What's the quantifier? And then I invoked the canonical form. And this is a very formularic, straightforward way of doing more complicated groups and properties. Just be careful of some of the common tricks, especially the cat-dog example. We've gone over more of these complex clauses, and we're really able to symbolize a lot of things. But you may have noticed that one thing that is suspiciously missing is negation. I haven't symbolized anything where I have the negation of a quantifier, and that's what we're going to do next.